Hi, I'm Rob Cos and welcome to my shop. One of the simplest woodworking hand tools, the router plane is also one of the most precise. One of my favorite specialty planes, stay with me and I'm going to introduce you to the precision of the router plane. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new and you haven't subscribed, please do so. Hit the notification bell so you'll receive alerts when we release a new video. And anytime we use a special tool, we'll always leave a description down below. All right, let's get to work. As you start to accumulate hand planes, it won't be soon after your basic set, you're going to want to add either both or one of these router planes. Its primary function is to cut a surface that is parallel to the reference surface. It has a blade that's adjustable in height. You can actually get several different blades, but simple as it is, you lock that in place, and then by running that off of one surface, the bottom or the area being cut ends up being perfectly parallel to that surface referenced on the bottom of the plane. Really simple. Two different sizes to choose from. Let's go into it a little bit deeper. When choosing a router plane, I think the most important, of course it has to be accurately milled and all the rest of it, but the most important part is to look for how the blade is held in place. And Stanley had a router plane that was extremely popular. But the mechanism that held the blade in place, I felt was faulty. In fact, I've had them come apart on me in mid-use. And I think what Lee Nielsen has done has perfected it. So it's as simple as having a hole milled down through the body of the tool that is actually a square, and then a square-shaped. I prefer this style because it won't turn on you. A square-shaped cutter that fits up in there. Now you've got a brass screw that pushes on this corner, so it drives this cutter against this side and that side and locks it firmly in place. There's no play, it's permanently, it's fixed, it does not move. In fact, on this larger one, which has an adjustment, what I like to do is put just a little bit of tension on that so that when I'm making this adjustment, there's a little bit of pressure and it can really go in there and it's a much finer, it provides for a much finer adjustment. Won't allow that blade to accidentally fall. And then when you get it where you want it, you just snug it up a little bit more. But that, in my opinion, is the absolute best way to secure that blade in place. And when it comes to adjusting the depth on the small one, which is referred to as the number 271, all you have to do is put that in place Loosen that knob. I use a screwdriver, but you can certainly do it by hand. Let that drop down. When you get it where you want it, simply snug it up. I always like to put the screwdriver on it just to give it a little extra torque. On the larger model, as I showed you earlier, it has a, a little more of a refined adjustment. I take just a little bit of pressure on that screw, and then you can turn the knob to either advance it or retract it. Now, something you can also get with this larger one is a depth stop. So if you loosen this off and take this all the way out, you can slide over this depth stop or collar, back that off. Put this back together. Now if you're working on multiple grooves or dados and they're all going to be the same depth but you can't hog all that material with one setting you can get the one setting that is going to be your final setting and then you can simply go in and work each one at various stages but when the last one comes you just drop it down to the collar lock it and then you get that repeatability that's nice and accurate Of course, the question that's always asked is, how do you sharpen the blade? Now, first of all, what you need to realize is you don't really do a whole lot of work with a router plane blade. So it's not like you're going to have to sharpen it on a regular blade basis. You might get a three or four months, you might get a year out of it. But like any blade, it's got two cutting surfaces, or it's got two surfaces that meet to create the cutting edge. One is going to be the bottom, the other is going to be the bevel. So like any chisel, you are gonna go in first and polish what would be the bottom or if we were talking about a chisel we'd call it the back and I find with these small blades 
that if you try to push them forward, they often chatter. So what I'm doing is pushing, putting my finger right on the bevel and then just pushing down and pulling back. And do that until you've eliminated all of the grinding marks from the factory. And it's not a very large surface area, so it won't take that long. Once you've been able to remove all of those grinding scratches with whatever stone you're using, in this case it's a 1000 grit, I would then progress to the next grit and then finish off with my final grit. In my case, it would be a 16,000. Now the bevel is a little more difficult, although not terrible. And what you're going to do is you've got to have your stone so that your blade can be hanging down. You're going to find that primary bevel, which is going to be the main bevel on there. Remember, you don't need to polish all of that because only part that touches the wood is right up here. So I'll find that primary bevel, raise the blade up just a little bit, and just do little forward and back strokes, concentrating on keeping the blade flat on the stone. Flip it over and look, and you should have a uniform uh, secondary bevel created. Once you've done that, you're going to go to your final stone. You don't need to go to an in-between, not on a little surface like that. Again, find your Find your primary, come up just a little bit higher than the previous stone. In other words, you're, you're applying a tertiary bevel to save time. Little wee short strokes. You can't really do much more than that anyway because of the long stem running down. And once you've done that, a second or two on the final stone just to remove any burr, and you're good to go. Now there is a fence that you can get, actually I think it comes with the large router plane, and I must admit I've never used it, I'll, I'm going to show you why, but if you did need it, you can use it one of two ways. If you're working on an irregular shaped or a round edge, you could use this one where you've got two contact points. It doesn't give you a whole lot of stability, but there's an adjustment knob that you can just simply go in there. There's three different holes where you can thread that into, get it where you want it and lock it in place, or you can turn it around and you can use a flat side. Well, I would typically would want a whole lot more reference surface than what this little thing provides. And by the way, you can use it on either side. So I'll show you what I would prefer. I actually often use this. I like to have an extra base. And the reason is I want a lot more reference surface for when I'm using the tool than what I have with this. Um, one of the functions I'm going to show you is how you can go in and adjust the thickness of a tenon. And when you're doing that, you've only got part of the plane referencing on the registration surface. The other's in, out in midair, and the cutter is such that it's wanting to pull it this way. Well, in those circumstances, I like to have a lot of extra surface area over here, bearing surface, that will keep this nice and stable. So what I've done is I've used to, taken a piece of torrified maple, which is nice and stable, and I simply drilled a couple of quarter inch diameter holes with a nut and washer to keep that in place. And if I need to use a fence, I now have a much bigger surface that I can clamp on a longer surface that will give me much more reference for when it comes to working a long edge or any time that you're doing an area that requires the stability or the accuracy of a fence. I just think that little short, that little one that comes with it, and it really isn't big enough to add anything to it. So if you're doing something where you're going to need the reference of a fence, get yourself a base plate like this, held securely in place, because you don't want anything to move. And then any kind of a long stick of wood that would be put on there and you could clamp it on. And then that gives you all kinds of reference surface. Usually I just do this freehand actually. By the way, my base plate is 12 by four and a half. And I find that's just right. You can make it bigger, you can make it a little bit smaller, but that one works well for me. So you've cut a dado, whether it's in solid wood or plywood. 
And if you're using a router or if you're using a dado blade on a table saw, the chances are you're not always going to have that depth absolutely accurate. You go to put something together and you've got a bit of a bump in there and now your shoulder doesn't close or the case ends up being spread a little bit because it bottomed out here. So what I prefer to do, obviously hog off the majority of the material with whatever manner you're cutting your dado, but then bring your router plane into play. And this is where you can go in. You can, if you want to set the depth, I sometimes just go in and set the depth at the lowest point. But if you have a fixed dimension in mind, this is where I like to just put a little bit of pressure on the screw. Make sure that's loose. Just as, as I'm moving it, I'm turning the knob just until I start to pick up a shaving. There. And I'll lock it in place. I can lock this one too in case I have to do this in another spot. And then I usually go right down the middle first. Now, if this is going to be seen, instead of plowing through this way, which you may break some fibers off, I'll turn it around and come in from the end. Then once you've gone down through the middle, go over to the side. You don't want to disturb this, so I'm turning it slightly, but I want that corner to be right in the corner of my blade right into the corner. Make sure there's no debris up on the top that's going to interfere. But if there's a chance you're going to tear something out, then again, flip it around and come in from the end. This is the absolute best way to get a dado with a uniform depth all the way across. And on something smaller, you can go in and use your small rotor plane the exact same way. So that's probably the primary function. On to the next. This may be one that you had not thought of. You've cut a tenon, trying to fit it into your mortise, and you're trying to get it exact. This, by the way, is what I would call a go-no-go -go joint. If it's too loose, the glue does not fill the gap. If it's too tight, it pushes all of the glue down to the bottom, so all you've got is a mechanical fit. It literally needs to go in and have the two sides touching the two sides of the uh, mortise in order for you to get a good joint. And if you're trying to sneak up on it to get it just right, well, here's what you can do. Again, we'll loosen these up. Put just enough pressure in here to give me a little bit of back force when I'm advancing it. Now the first thing I'd want to do is make sure that I've cut it and it's parallel to the face of the board. So once I feel it start to touch, I'll lock it in place. I'll start out here in the end. A lot of pressure on my left hand because as I mentioned, now you notice that I'm touching here but not there. So I'm going to go down here which I know is my lowest point. Okay, that's making contact. I like to shear, meaning have the blade on a bit of an angle. Lots of force on my left hand, keeping the router plane so that it is or remains parallel to this face. Get right into that corner. Careful not to allow your right hand to put downward pressure. Now, if in the process of doing this you discover that you're just a shaving off, what you can do is take, uh, literally take a shaving of wood. Let's see if I can get one that comes in out intact. Set that in place. Put your router plane on it. Drop the blade down until it just makes contact. Snug it up. Remove the shaving, which is going to allow the plane to drop just the thickness of the shaving. 
and then you can go in and just lift that last little bit of material and allow you to really sneak up on that. Remember, lots of pressure on the left side. That'll allow you to get a perfect fit with the mortise and tenon. Next one. If you're cutting a rabbit on the back of a panel, and again, and using the table saw or a router, it's not always as accurate as you would like. You can come in with your router plane, get that set, lock it in place. Now this is a long grain cut, so you may want to pay attention to grain direction. Get right into the corner. Same as before, you've got to keep lots of pressure on the side that's making contact with the panel, in this case, my left side. Now any of those operations can also be done with the small router plane. What I like about the small router plane is that the support of the of the uh, side, the flat pieces are a lot closer to the blade on this plane than they are on the large rotor plane, unless of course you put a, an additional base on there. I like this, it's, uh, it's very convenient, very simple, there's no moving parts. One screw to adjust the blade and you just move it by hand up or down. Not very expensive, but an extremely accurate tool. And as I mentioned, I think everybody should have at least one rotor plane in their arsenal. Hi, if you like my work, if you like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. And I've always said, better tools make it a whole lot easier. If you click on the icon with the plane and the chisel, it'll take you to our website, introduce you to all of our tools, and also talk to you about our online and in-person workshops. Good luck in your woodwork.